Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Black Christmas. Wait, no, not that Black Christmas. That one's good. Haha, <laughs> no, not that Black Christmas. That one's weird. Yes, this Black Christmas, released in 2019. The original Black Christmas is one of the earliest and best slashers. It's atmospheric, scary, and has an amazing cast, including Margot Kidder, Olivia Hussey, and John the Saxman Saxon. And rest in glorious peace, my kick-ass friend. The first remake, from 2006, also features a recognizable cast, but has a lot more incest and cannibalism, so, you know, not the same. As for this remake, well, there's kind of a lot to say about it, so settle in for a long intro. You probably already know that this came out to mostly negative reviews from critics and a fervorous hatred from places online, with many upset about its overtly feminist themes. I agree that this is a very bad movie, but I also think that its recent inclusion on the IMDb Bottom 100 is purely political. There are plenty of worse movies out there. Fans of this channel should know, I've covered some. I don't even know if it's that much worse than the 2006 remake, which was also pretty awful, just in a different way. More eyeballs! Blumhouse found itself with access to the rights for Black Christmas and asked Sophia to call to write and direct a remake for them. Interestingly, she would be the studio's first female director for a theatrical release in the company's 10 years of productions. Horror fans may recognize to call from a segment in VHS, and I've also heard good things about her film Always Shine and her Into the Dark episode, New Year, New You. But Takal got the job in February for a movie scheduled to be released in December, giving her and co-writer April Wolf just two months to work on the script before they were rushed off to New Zealand to begin pre-production. From conception to release was only nine months, a shockingly short time frame that helps explain the weak screenplay and messy editing. This Black Christmas hardly qualifies as a remake. Aside from a few nods to the Bob Clark classic, the only similarities are that it's sorority sisters on campus during Christmas time, and the holiday setting isn't even necessary for its story. Instead of something more straightforward, To Call and Wolf wanted to adapt the feeling of the original, taking its feminist ideas and making them more, quote, mainstream. I'm a big fan of the original. I think for the time it was made, it was way ahead of its time in terms of dealing with issues about women. And so I wanted to make a movie that felt similarly contemporary about women's issues today. They settled on a story centered around college campus rape culture, and were surprised when that theme didn't earn them an automatic R. They decided to edit their movie to get a PG-13, wanting younger teenage girls to see relevant issues explored on screen, and maybe even get them interested in the horror genre. Both truly commendable goals. Unfortunately, I think the themes are dealt with in a way that's too superficial and simplified to start any conversations. Boys will be, well, you know. All the characters are very obviously either good or evil, the dialogue sounds like it was taken directly from Twitter, and there are too many moments that feel like corporate-style female empowerment, which can easily come back around to feeling condescending. That all combines to leave a lot of viewers upset for different reasons, and although some of those reasons are rooted in hatred, in the end, I don't think Takal accomplished her goals. It was really important for me to not make a movie that was completely anti-man, finding male actors who felt that way as well, and making a movie that is trying to condemn a certain type of masculinity, but not men in general. I'm sad that the movie's messaging wound up so overbearing, because I think these themes are worth looking at in horror movies. Some of my favorite horror films are unabashedly feminist. The Descent is about strong women and complicated friendships. Better Watch Out is a frickin' dissertation on toxic masculinity and male entitlement. And Jennifer's Body is all about women taking control of their sexuality. And of course, Lest we forget, the original Black Christmas followed a protagonist who was fearful of an overbearing boyfriend and involved in an abortion plotline the year after Roe v. Wade. Feminist horror movies can and do kick ass, just not this one, and that's okay. There are still kills to count under the Christmas tree, so let me get to them before it gets too late for Santa to visit. The movie begins with a quote about man, attributed to Calvin Hawthorne, founder of Hawthorne College, whose bust is currently being chanted at by a bunch of hooded weirdos. Cool. The girls at Hawthorne Sorority Delta Sig are having themselves a Christmas bop around. Not Sister Lindsay though, she's on her way home for Christmas break, meaning she won't be able to get her secret Santa gift, a vibrator. Every girl needs a little self-care. 
Now you'll never need a man. Lindsay starts getting DMs on an app called Yip Yap by Calvin Hawthorne himself, the busty fella. And it's not this rando behind her sending these threatening messages. He's just heading home. Nope, it's this hooded guy who chases Lindsay through lawns full of Christmas lights until she's banging on a front door for help. Too bad she knocked on the door of La Casa de Hooded Guy, who takes an icicle from the awning and stabs Lindsay in the chest, sending this little snow angel up to snow heaven. Man, I bet snow heaven is cold. With that literal cold open over, we meet protagonist Riley Stone, played by Imogen Poots, whose first big role came when she was 17 years old and 28 weeks later. She's also in Green Room, which fucking rips. Riley's part of the sorority Moo Kappa Epsilon, and she's got a lot of Moo Cap friends. Her little sister Helena, her bubbly sister Jessie, and her forward sister Franny. I have a final in 10 minutes and I can't find my diva cup. I saw in comments online that this movie taught some people what a diva cup is, so hey, at least it did that. One of Riley's teachers is the douchey Professor Gelson, who takes joy in making her uncomfortable as he quotes Camille Paglia, the longtime social critic from UArts in Philadelphia. Gelson's eyeing Riley irately because her mooncap sister Chris is petitioning to get him fired, her latest activist effort after successfully having the founder's bust removed from the administration's building. Calvin Hawthorne was a racist and a sexist. He owned slaves in the North. As for her efforts against Professor Gelson, he went totally crazy on me when all I did was ask why his syllabus has no women on it, queer people on it, trans people on it, people of color on it. It feels like Chris is written to be a caricature of cancel culture. Though Chris complains of the white supremacist patriarchy, her sisters Riley and Marty aren't as wrapped up in her social justice furor. This dude Landon's down to show support though, and signs Chris's petition before awkwardly flirting with Riley. Oh, and then the dude gets stuck awkwardly holding a door for a ton of people? <laughs> Don't worry guys, she thinks it's cute. Way cuter than this Phil dude who's from fraternity Delta Kappa Omicron, aka DKO. The Founders Fraternity. Phil's an upsetting sight because another deke, Brian Huntley, raped Riley three years ago. Brian was DKO president and has since graduated, but Phil says he'll be back tonight for their big talent show, something the Moos are forced to attend cause, um, you know, Greek stuff or whatever. For the talent show, the Moos are going to do a little ditty, and they get ready for the song and dance, while just down the hall, the deeks are doing spooky pledge rituals in front of the Founders bus, which is leaking black goo from its eyes. The power of the founder compels you. Compels you to look like a goober, I guess. Riley finds Helena at the start of a date rape with that Phil dude kissing on her even as she mumbles no. The issue of sexual assault on college campuses is a real one and definitely deserves to be addressed in film. I'm just not sure how effective it is to make the perpetrator so overtly misogynist when in truth, it often comes from people who aren't this cartoonishly evil. You bitches are all the same. You act like you want it, but you're all a bunch of teases. Also, that line was clearly added in post-production, meaning it's an unnecessary emphasis to an already obvious point. Helena is way too drunk to perform, so she heads back to the sorority house, leaving the quartet without a fourth member. That is, unless Chris can convince Riley to join them, saying it'll be empowering to perform with her rapist Brian Huntley in the audience. He used to be a fighter. It's time to be a fighter again. Way to pressure the rape survivor into doing something she doesn't want to, Chris. Awesome friend, great job. At the start of the Doot Dootin' performance, Riley's frozen by the sight of Brian Huntley, but she's able to recover and jump in at the important part. Up in the frat house, one true fact. <laughs> and now is that I got attacked. In the film's most memorable scene, Riley sings lyrics targeted at Brian, even though originally they didn't know he was gonna be there. And it's not like she's making it up on the spot. The ladies sing some lines together. Up in the frat house, click, click, click. You slip me a roofie and then you're dead. <laughs> I guess it would work as an attack against the Deeks in general, though. They finish and flee the stage, celebrating a lesson hopefully made clear. Maybe that is just Brian Huntley not to rape another girl. They leave the Deke house with Marty's boyfriend Nate, pet named Smoosh, and are also joined by that Landon dude, who's not a Deke, but saw and liked their performance. While they're out taking snowy walks, at the sorority house, Helena drunkenly packs her suitcase to go home. But who's that on her yip yap? Calvin Hawthorne? Yep, yeah. No big surprise then when a hooded dude appears behind her. After a nightmare reliving her trauma at the Deke house, Riley awakens the next morning and heads off with her sisters to go Christmas 
tree hunting with Nate. Franny doesn't join them, since she has a train home to catch, but she never makes it to the station, because while looking for the house cat Claudette, she's caught up in an homage to Exorcist 3. Oh, there you are. Franny gets killed, and her body is later seen, staying cold on the Moo Kappa balcony. The sisters find a giant tree that Chris is happy to provide the funds for. My dad left me his card so I can spend whatever I want over winter break. Because he oh. bailed on us and botched her. See, that right there is an interesting idea to me. The whole intersection of feminism and class and the blind spots that can occur there. Sadly, the movie never bothers exploring anything that specific. But since this is a Black Christmas movie, we need some phone harassment. So Riley gets zapped with a yip yap. Ah, crap. She also gets a phone call from Wat Tambor. Hello? But that's just a fake scare and a quick reference to Billy's rantings. The call is actually from Helena's mom, saying her daughter never made it home for the holidays. That gets Riley concerned, especially because she keeps getting yip-yap attacked. She goes to campus security and reports Helena as missing, but Officer Gil O'Leary dismisses her concerns. We need more than feelings in this business. No matter what you think of the rest of the film, Imogen Poots fucking nails the frustration of a victim not being listened to. Her performance is definitely stand out, but I don't really blame any of the cast for their work. Even with such one-note simple characters, they give a good sense of who each person is and how they're different. And I think it's worth noting that they all seem to love working under Sophia Takal. Riley goes to the Deke house, wondering if Helena might be inside, and is found by Professor Gelson. If you didn't realize earlier, Gelson's played by Carrie Elwes, who was once Wesley, a pirate, and Lawrence Gordon, who, uh, wait, what were you again, Gordo? I'm a doctor. He's a doctor, that's right. Nelson's got a list with some sister names on it, but he hides it away as he monologues about the university's great history. Wanting to protect its reputation, he asks Riley to take down a video that Chris posted of their Deke House performance. Might be in Riley's best legal interest too, considering the claim made in it. Though Chris thinks sharing the performance will embolden other women, Riley wants them to quiet down to stop the threats she's been getting. This is another interesting dynamic that should have been explored more. The question of if an individual victim has some kind of responsibility to make things public, even if it makes them uncomfortable. Why not explore whether Chris is too focused on performative activism, especially given that she apparently comes from an upper class family? None of that gets discussed in this movie, and instead, Chris is pretty much just validated in the end. Marty and Chris admit that they've been getting weird DMs too, but we don't know if Jesse has since she pieced out when their argument began. When you guys fight, Heike stresses me out. She left to go look for Christmas lights in the attic, which is a great idea if you're looking to get killed in a slasher. Shame. I liked Brittany O'Grady's playful performance. Do Christmas lights expire? She was also good in Star, which I saw when I worked at Fox. Jesse is killed in a way too telegraphed scare after plugging in some Christmas lights that illuminate a dude who attacks her. Riley and Chris's argument about how pushy Chris can be has been doing a real number on Nate, who's been going through some shit in the background of the movie. In his first scene, the so-called smoosh is kind of ingratiating in how eager and lovey he is. But in each subsequent appearance, he's gotten more and more short-tempered. And at this point, he's pounding beers and full-on yelling at the ladies. The argument they have is a little confusing to me, though. Nate does some blatantly shitty things like victim blaming and making false equivalencies, but he also tries to raise other points only to get shouted down anyway. Not all men have power. Did you just not all men me? Did you just not all men are rapists, Chris, okay? I'm not. But you just lump me in with the bad ones because I'm a man. After Marty kicks Nate out of the house, the ladies get more threatening DMs, and Chris feels the need to respond. I said, hey, Calvin Hawthorne, why don't you come down here, bite my ass, and make me a panini on my mom's press? Oh my. <laughs> Oh, that's right, this is a horror movie. I guess it's time for something to happen. A hooded masked dude shows up and grazes Marty's leg with an arrow. And while they hide from him, he collects their fallen phones. Cause you've gotta write shit like that into modern day horror movies. Since Marty's bleeding badly, Riley volunteers to go find a phone. With most of the power turned off, her venture is lit by Christmas lights. And call me a sucker, but Christmas lights always look nice to me. Unless they're blinking, fuck that. Chris realizes that Jesse is missing and not wanting to abandon a sister, heads towards the attic to get her. She finds her sitting wrapped in Christmas lights with an axe right in her face. But the shot cuts away so fast, you can barely friggin' tell. Riley hears footsteps and hides, but it just ends up being Nate, having returned to apologize to Marty. He blames his aggression on a weird migraine that hits him again while he's talking, once again pumping up his testosterone. 
someone hurts my girl, it's my duty to protect them. Show yourself, coward! But then he just gets shot in the face with an arrow. Womp womp. The hooded masked figure starts beating on Riley, cutting slashes in her cheek and giving her mistletoe kisses. But she's able to get some keys between her knuckles and jams them into the dude's neck right as Chris and Marty hobble in. They tell Riley Jesse's dead, she shows them Nate is too, but then more hooded dudes and masks show up. It's hard for me to tell if multiple killers was supposed to be a twist, since anyone who watched the trailer knew that was gonna happen. That trailer revealed way too much, man. Marty tries to make a stand, but she's pretty quickly overpowered and hacked in the gut with a hatchet. She lives long enough to help her sisters get away, and after her killer leaves, reaches for her phone before she dies. Security officer O'Leary gets a call from 911 and speeds off in his car as the women at Moo Kappa are found in their kitchen. They fight back with knives and kill the attacker with a stab in the back and an off-screen stab to the head. As for O'Leary, we were needlessly getting tricked by editing. He actually just showed up at the other sorority, Delta Sig, where he found those sisters killing a similarly hooded home intruder, using a glass unicorn horn, which of course was used to kill Margot Kidder in the original. O'Leary's not able to provide any help anyway, because he gets stabbed in the back, another victim of this coordinated campus-wide event. The ladies realize that they're not covered in blood, but rather the same sticky black liquid Riley saw coming from the Founders bus, which has also been getting all over the place. Aw, poor kitty. And Riley recognizes their attacker as the Deke pledge she saw doing that gooey ritual. By the way, the mask that the Deke army soldiers wear was inspired by Scold's bridles, iron muzzles used to publicly humiliate unruly women. Very on theme for this film. Chris goes to get the keys, but struggles with them for some reason, long enough for another Deke to show up and start strangling her against the floor. Riley rescues Chris by suffocating him with a dry cleaner bag. Another instance of these women killing with weapons used against them in the original. I like that repurposing. Chris and Riley get out of there, and though Chris wants to go to the police, Riley points out that they didn't believe her about her rape, so she'd rather they try to stop the Deeks themselves. After all, that black goo ritual looked like bad news. It was like black magic or sorcery or something. Yep, this movie is straight up supernatural, and Riley thinks the Founder's Bust is providing magic use to control their attackers. I think the supernatural element is an unnecessary mess, and possibly undermines the movie's whole message. I guess since the goo is meant to be literal toxic masculinity, maybe it's saying campus culture is brainwashing young men, but it still feels like their attackers don't have any agency, and thus maybe aren't entirely culpable? I don't know. Despite Riley recapping the entire entire fucking movie in this scene, Chris doesn't believe her and refuses to help. I thought that you were a fighter. Yeah, I did too. Why is the character who's been shown to be combative and vocal about sisterhood choosing to run away from a fight and let her sister fly solo? Seems forced and out of character. A mere plot contrivance that allows Chris to intersect with the other sorority, Delta Sig. Those sisters tell her that sororities all over campus are being attacked, and the sight of another Deke head reignites Chris's sorora pride. On her way to DKO with a, uh, plastic shovel as a weapon, I guess? Riley runs into Landon, who offers to help in any way he can. Using a hide -a key Landon enters the Deke house and starts breaking shit as a distraction, so Riley can sneak inside. A whole horde of Deke heads show up, hooded and pressed, so Landon had better choose his words wisely. I want you to suck a fat fart because you just got zated. Or I guess he could just say that. He starts experiencing the same headaches we saw rack Nate's brain. That's just the founder Ugh. drawing out your <sighs> true alpha. Aw, oh, Founder, is that what's making you leak so much? If so, maybe stop it. You're so wet. Before Riley can destroy the bust, she hears Helena screaming, and, not wanting to let a sister suffer, finds her tied up. But this little sister's actually a little schemer, and Riley gets knocked out. When she comes to, she sees Landon being forced to undergo the Deke ritual, and being told it'll give him power. Then we get a paddle boy percussion performance by the creepiest lads in the land. And here's their head creeper now. Professor Gelson. Damn you, Gelson. I never liked you and your expensive groceries. Gelson says that when Chris's petition forced the Founders bus to be moved to the frat house, they discovered that Calvin Hawthorne had hidden a secret power inside of it. Hawthorne foresaw the threat posed by women, so he took precautions in case they strayed too far out of line. 
The Deeks have been using the magical goo to create an army of killer pledges with gender grievances. They and all of DKO will go on to fill courtrooms and boardrooms and take power back from women in society. These are the words that the characters say. The Deeks have been targeting outspoken women, with Helena helping them. She made that list of names that Gelson had earlier. She all about that trad wife life. Aren't you tired? Fighting against your true nature? But even though she's helped them, the Deeks still have her killed when a brainwashed masked pledge breaks her neck. Riley's rapist Brian Huntley appears and says that if she doesn't bow to them, she'll be killed too. Your body, your choice. Wait, that was Brian, right? Because I can't really tell the difference between him and that Phil dude. They're both nothing characters who are one-dimensionally evil. She agrees to be subservient and kneels on the floor, but while Brian's celebrating his dominance, she has a brief moment of fighting back, during which she scars his face, kind of like what happened to hers earlier. Still, the masked pledge is able to just about choke the life out of her until he's killed by an arrow that goes through his back. You messed with the wrong sisters. Great, now we're full on Avengers Inc. with one woman using a menorah to fight? Even though the Deeks outnumber the sisters and are supposed to have super strength, it's somehow an even match, albeit one with boring choreography. What is that guy doing? Brian fights with Riley in a way that gives her traumatic flashbacks, but the sight of Chris getting strangled gives her strength enough to fight him off. Riley makes her way to the founder's bust and lifts it high above her head. Gelson tries to talk her down, saying if she breaks the power of men, it'll break women or something? I don't know. But she tells him to fuck off and smashes it open on the ground. Goo This causes the clone troopers to deactivate, and Chris gets a chance to finally fire Gelson. Hey, Professor. Suck. My. Yep, she literally just says suck my, because they cut the original line for that PG-13. Not sure why they didn't replace it with another word. And what was the original line, you ask? Hey, Professor. Suck. My. Clit! So I guess he can't say clit without an age restriction. A no longer brainwashed Landon helps fight off some of the Deeks, and Riley lets us know Chris was this movie's moral center the whole time. I'm so sorry! You were right! I should have been fighting this whole time! Now, not really the time for I told you so, but I did tell you so! Landon and the ladies escape the room, repeat the joke they just fucking did. I'm so sorry! Hey, that wasn't me! They did some magic shit! Not and then lock the doors behind them. Yes, that's right, they barricade a bunch of boys inside a burning building. And, you know, fuck the rapists, but didn't we just learn that the pledges were all brainwashed? By the same power that had been controlling Landon, who's no longer under the spell. Seems a bit killy to lock them up inside, but that's exactly what the sisters do. Since all the deeks we saw at the ceremony were locked inside the burning building, I'm counting 15 kills here. Three named characters, Gelson, Brian Hunt, and that Phil dude, and 12 unnamed pledges who were in the room lining the walls during the ceremony. I'm not counting the mask dude though, cause I already did when he was killed with an arrow. Oh, and uh, th then the movie ends. That's it. How many kills could a campus have during Christmas break? Let's find out and get to the- Ah! Oh! Oh! Let's get to the numbers! Yeah! And then punch some babies! By my count, 27 people died in this Black Christmas. The victims consisted of five sorority sisters and 22 dudes, most of whom were brainwashed pledges. Mmm, pledge pie. With a runtime of 92 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 3.41 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the first Deke pledge kill. Keys being used like that is a great weapon for a movie with these themes, and the kill was also decently bloody. Dull machete for lamest mm. kill will go to Jesse, killed off screen and without ever a good look at the damage. And that's it. Black Christmas came out in 2019, the same year as the movie I'm looking at on Sunday. Motherfucking Dr. Sleep. I consider that movie a modern masterpiece, so rent it and watch it and join me then. Merry Christmas and happy holidays, everyone. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Christmas Kill Count. Do me a favor and try to be civil in the comments, all right? Not asking you to like this movie, I definitely didn't. But like, don't be a dick about larger issues, you know? Also, that is a Ronald Reagan bust. It was one of the few that could be delivered here in time. And I felt like, you know, with this movie, it kind of makes sense. I know this time of year can be tough for some people. So I hope you're all doing okay. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.